All right, let's do it. And 
And in fact, if you look at this movie here, you can see it's spinning counterclockwise. Uh, this picture has north up, so is it in Jupiter's northern hemisphere or a southern hemisphere? Southern hemisphere. So, which direction do winds deflect due to the Coriolis effect in the southern hemisphere? Do they deflect to the right or do they deflect to the left? They deflect to the left. Yep, they deflect to the left. And the idea is that the, the part of the Great Red Spot we can see, the upper levels, act as a high pressure system. There's going to be convection carrying gas from below where it spreads out up at the top of the Great Red Spot. So it's acting as a high pressure system. Winds flow out of the high pressure system because it's at higher pressure than its surroundings. And then if Jupiter were not rotating, they'd flow straight out. But it is rotating rather rapidly, about every 10 hours or so, spinning faster than Earth is, and it's bigger than Earth. So both those things make the Coriolis effect stronger. The winds deflect to the left, remember, as you're walking along the direction of the wind. So not necessarily to the left on the picture, but it's to the left if you imagine you're walking along the direction of the wind. And so if you follow along the direction of the wind and hang a left at each location, you can see that the arrows do as indicated here, and that means that we are driving this counterclockwise circulation pattern. So the Great Red Spot is a high pressure system with winds blowing out of it, deflected to the left by the Coriolis effect because it's in the southern hemisphere, and put it all together, and what do you got? A counterclockwise spinning storm like that. It's lasted for hundreds of years. As long as we've been able to see it, it's been there. We have no idea how old it is in the end, but it's been as long as we've been seeing it on Jupiter, as long as we've had telescopes to look at Jupiter. Yes? Um, so, storms spin counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere? Uh, it depends on what kind of storm it is. If this was a low pressure system instead of a high pressure system, then the winds would still be deflecting to the left, but if you deflect to the left for winds flowing into a low pressure system,
That's the basic idea with the Roche Tidal Zone. The Roche Tidal Zone is the region surrounding the planet where the tidal forces on a moon would be so large that it would tear the moon apart. Not just stretch it out, but tear the moon apart. Something the size of a moon would be torn apart by tidal forces if it were closer than the Roche Tidal Zone. And planetary rings uh, tend to be within the Roche Tidal Zone because if they were outside the tidal zone, all those uh, boulders and, and so forth flying around would tend to accrete into a satellite. Saturn's wings would accrete into a small satellite, something like 60 kilometers I across, I think, something like that, if they could do so. But tidal, they're the particles are close enough to Saturn within its Roche tidal limit uh, that they're not allowed to accrete into a moon because they'd be ripped apart as soon as they try. <coughs> yes? Are there going to be more questions on the recent chapters? There might be a bit more, but uh, on the other hand, there's definitely stuff from every chapter on there is what it comes down to. So, uh, I actually, I haven't counted, I mean, it's already written, and, and I didn't bother counting how many from every chapter, but it's fairly evenly distributed, I think, with maybe a little bit of emphasis on, like, the, the Jovian planets, but not a huge amount of emphasis on it, compared to the other chapters. I mean. Yes?
to a good approximation is sitting stationary at a focus. It's not really sitting stationary because there's a force on it too. But if one thing is much more massive than the thing that's being that's orbiting it, then it hardly moves, and it's a good approximation to say that it's sitting there at the focus. That's a decent approximation for planets going around the sun, for example. It's not perfect, but it's decent. Okay. Any questions on Kepler's first law? Kepler's second law says that the line from the planet to the sun sweeps out equal areas in equal amounts of time. And so the idea there is that if the planet takes the same amount of time to go from here to here as it does to go from here to here, then the area swept out by the line from the planet to the sun will be equal. What if this area here on the left was twice as big as this area on the right, and it took the planet one month to go across the distance that it moves on the right there? How long does it take the planet to go along that arc on the left? That would be two months in that case, right? So equal areas if the times are equal, not equal areas if the times are not equal. If the area is twice as big, the time it takes to do it is twice as big. Note too carefully, it doesn't say equal distances, it says equal areas, right? The line from the planet to the sun sweeps out equal areas in equal amounts of time. And that implies that the planet moves mm, when it's closer to the sun than when it's further from the sun. It moves faster when it's closer to the sun than when it's further from the sun. Kepler's second law. Kepler's third law is the one that says that the bigger the orbit, i.e. the bigger the semi-major axis, the longer it takes the planet to go around the sun, more particularly if you measure the period of the planet, how long it takes to go once around the sun in years, and you measure <coughs> the length of the semi-major axis in AU, astronomical units, the size of the semi-major axis, then P squared is equal to A cubed is the formula you move in order to uh, figure out how long it takes the planet to go around the sun if you know the semi-major axis, or what the semi-major axis is if you know what the period is. If you know one, in other words, you can figure out the other from that formula there. Yes? So P is equal to the AUs? Uh, P is the period in years. So P is the one that's measured in years because it's a time. It's how long it takes the planet to go around. And A is measured in AUs because it's the distance. It's the size of the semi-major axis. So P squared equals A cubed. Yeah, they square what the period is cube what the semi major axis is and they'll be equal to one another. And that's Kepler's third law, my personal favorite because it's also called the harmonic law. So I like that. Yes. Or as I prefer to call it the harmonic law, but I've never managed to get that one proved so it should be, but whatever.
in order to get back to the same phase, say new moon to new moon again. Um, so is that what you were going to ask next? Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh -huh. right. So it's like I'm reading your mind. Nothing's going to make me miss that. 
Uh, okay, <laughs> this is me forgetting which chapter has it again. Uh, is it two? Is it chapter two? Okay. conductor 
that is in a planet which is rotating fast enough and it's toasty enough on the inside that there can be convection inside that liquid electrical conductor. Those are the ingredients for a planetary dynamo. Um, so take, for example, uh, everybody's favorite planet, wait. So does Earth have any liquid electrical conductor in its interior? Yes. yes, it does. It would be its liquid outer core, right? And that liquid outer core is made of mostly what metal? Iron. iron. And the point is, iron, you know, you don't make iron wires because it's not the best thing to make wires out of, but it is a metal, so it does electrically conduct. So Earth has a liquid electrical conductor in it, namely its liquid outer iron core. Earth is spinning pretty fast, so it's got that ingredient. I mean, 24 hours, but planet-wise, that's not bad. That's, that's fast enough. And, uh, as a bonus, Earth is toasty warm on the inside, so there's convection happening inside that liquid electrical conductor. So if you're missing any of those, those ingredients, you're toast. Uh, and so, for example, oh yeah, uh, so, uh, so if a planet's cold on the inside, is it going to be able to generate magnetic field with the dynamo. No, it won't have the liquid. Uh, if it's not spinning very fast, can it generate a magnetic field with the dynamo? No, it's missing that ingredient, for example. So, so that's the deal with dynamos. For, for the Jovian planets, so how about Jupiter and Saturn? What's the liquid electrical conductor inside them? Yeah, liquid metallic hydrogen. They're, they have enough mass, they compress the hydrogen deep in their interiors enough that it actually acts like a metal. Uh, it actually conducts electricity. So they have big volumes of liquid metallic hydrogen that let them generate their magnetic fields, and they spin faster than Earth does, so they've definitely got that. They're big, so they're still warm and toasty, so they've got the ingredients. Uranus and Neptune, do they have liquid metallic hydrogen? No, they do not, but do they have something else that serves as an electrical conductor that's yes. liquid in their interior? Yes, they do. Uh, namely, what dissolved in what else? Uh, it's actually, they, we think it's the ammonia mostly that's dissolved in the water, but you're right in that there's also methane dissolved in that water too. So they have, they have watery mantles that have ammonia dissolved in it, and enough of that ammonia should be ionized, be missing electrons, that it acts kind of like salt water. Salt water is an electrical conductor because the sodium and chlorine ions ions dissociate from one another and they can flow as electrical currents as a result of that. Uh, ammonia it dissolved in water in their mantles seems to play that role when it comes down. Some of it dissociates and ionizes and so you get an electrical conductor as a result of that. Yes? Can you discuss the Cassini division and why it's there? Yeah, so the Cassini division is the gap in Saturn's rings. Uh, so in particular, go back to this picture again. That started out here, right? This is the Cassini division right here, the big gap between what's called the A ring and the B ring of Saturn. That's the Cassini division. And it arises because of an orbital resonance with one of Saturn's moons named Mimas, M-I-M-A-S, which is also affectionately known as the Death Star moon because it looks like the Death Star. I so don't remember. So it's a space station. It's a space station that's going to kill us all. Yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, Darth Vader lives on it, yeah, but you know what? The Empire has this real problem with a uh, single point of failure engineering, so I have a feeling we're going to be able to take care of it. Uh, they're very consistent with stupid engineering, you know, so it's good if your enemy's stupid. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I put a picture of Mimas in there, so I have to. This is Mimas. <laughs> you can see why it's called the Death Star Moon. Because it happens to have a crater on it that makes it look a lot like the Death Star. So as soon as they got photos back of it, they're like, holy crap, it's the Death Star. Uh, so that's Mimas. It's actually a small moon, but 
it is a distance from Saturn such that I can't remember what the, I can't remember if it's two to one or three to one. That's gone out of my head. Uh, so uh, I think it's three to one. It might be two to one. Whatever. But the idea, in other words, is that every if it's three to one, every three times a particle in the Cassini division went around Saturn, Mimas would go around once. And so as a result of that, they would keep a given particle would keep lining up with Mimas every third time that it went around Saturn. And so at the same point in its orbit, Mimas would give it a little tug, pull on it a little bit. Uh, because, uh, I mean, it's always pulling on it, but in other words, it would be at its closest point to Mimas consistently in the same part of its orbit because of that orbital resonance. It's the same thing that happens with uh, Io, Europa, and Ganymede around Jupiter with an orbital resonance. And the net effect of that is to clear the Cassini division. Because anything that was orbiting in the Cassini division keeps getting tugged at regular intervals at the same point of its orbit by Nemus, and so it ends up being pulled out of the Cassini division as a result of that, which is why there is a Cassini division in the first place. And there are lots of other uh, gaps in the rings that are caused by other resonances, but Nemus is the one that makes the most distinctive one with the Cassini. But the reason why the rings kind of look like a record player is because of orbital resonances that cause some places to not be as conducive to having particles stay there as others. Yes? Is Mimas closer to Jupiter to Saturn than, um, than the Galilean rings? Yeah, it's, I, I, we, no, wait. Wait, well, I, no, wait, I don't remember how far out it was. Let's see. So it's, it's about 123 miles across. So orbital period is 23 hours. That's pretty short. Uh, does it say how far it is from Saturn? Uh, I'm sure it does somewhere. So I'm guessing, yeah, it's probably a little bit closer because 23 hours is a pretty short period there. So one could look it up. I haven't recently, but yeah. But I think the answer to your question is yes. Feel free to prove me right or wrong. Yes? The rings are about a meter? About, uh, about 10 meters thick. It varies, but roughly 10 meters thick. About as thick as this room is what we're talking about, which ain't much for something that's thousands of miles across. Yeah. And they're made of like a very small, icy. They're made, they're made of they, <coughs> different, different parts of the rings have different uh, typical particle sizes, but they range from dust speck size up to the size of some, like small houses uh, as the kind of range of size that we're talking about. Um, so rocks to boulders is what, we're, is what we're largely talking about here, but there's also lots of things that are like dust speck size. And um, we're talking basically lots of water ice. They're highly reflective because they contain a lot of water ice. And in a lot of cases, it's like big chunks of water ice or rocks that are coated in water ice, that sort of thing. Other ices as well, but water is the most important. Water is, water is a molecule made of the first and third most abundant elements in the universe, and that's why it's abundant. It's all over the place. Some people get the impression that Earth is unique for having lots of water. That's not the case.